Netzpolitik in der Schweiz. Internet politics in Switzerland. And the organization uh, Digital Society Switzerland must always be mentioned at, in the same breath. The Digital Society is a, an organization that uh, here we have three uh, representatives of the Digital Society. The um, CEO, Kire, who is on the right-hand side as far from your point of view, Patrick in the middle, and then Martin. Actually, it's the other way around. Martin is on the right-hand side, and Kira is on the left-hand side. Yeah, hello, vielen Dank. Hello, and thanks a lot. I welcome you to our presentation about internet politics in Switzerland, and we will um, talk to you about the current state of affairs and new topics for the new year. First off, the, to the topics we'll talk about. In Switzerland, too, the police state and the surveillance laws are being expanded. And Kire will be telling you more about the surveillance law, the BÜPF. And we also um, are taking legal measures against mass surveillance and against... Um, network and, and um, data retention. And in Switzerland, even though it takes longer, we are now starting to introduce um, network bans and e-voting and an electronic ID is also coming. The implementation is not quite perfect, but it's coming. And last but not least, the um, revised data protection laws, EU is the EU is working on revisions of that and Switzerland is going to uh, uh, take over these revisions and that's how and now I hand over to Kire for the um, surveillance law. So the completely reworked um, law to um, on surveillance of post and telecommunications um, will um, will take will 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 Come into power in March 2018. Um, there are various um, transition periods for various aspects at the longest 24 months. Okay, so the current um, law um, applies to access providers and the services provided by them. That's um, email, voice over IP, etc. The revised law will also um, will be expanded to also apply to suppliers of derived communication services, um, which includes services that allow for an exchange of information, which basically means anyone. And it will also apply to people who allow third parties to use their network. This generally applies and is targeted at um, suppliers of public wire Wi-Fi. These providers of derived communication services are have the same duties as access providers if either of these two conditions apply. Either 10 surveillance requests in a year or the provider um, earns a uh, yearly, uh, not profit, but the other thing, of 100 million francs with at least 5,000 users. And that means they have a duty to actively be able to surveil something and to retain data of their users. Everybody else, when these two criteria do not apply, they have to tolerate surveillance. And this tolerance includes that they have to uh, provide access to buildings, devices, cables, systems, networks and services, which 
to the surveillance services like police or the um, sp specific service BÜPF so that they can do surveillance. Who has this duty to surveil must be able to identify the participants. This uh, uh, in Switzerland, it will no longer be as easy to just click together an email account. But the duty to identify yourself with a proper identification only applies to um, cellular services um, for every for every other service. Um, for example, sending a token via SMS is enough of an identification. This now also applies to um, professional providers of public Wi-Fi. Professional in this case means if the service has been um, delegated to a dedicated provider of Wi-Fi. On the other hand, if I as a restaurant owner say buy my own Wi-Fi access point and provide that to people, then I do not fall under this duty to identify um, participants. Still, what that means is that public Wi-Fis without SMS registration are going to die out even more. At least Freifunk is not um, affected because they are not professionally um, provided. But it's now also allowed um, for the services to check um, Wi-Fi's and look through these access points to find people. Then one important question that's still open is um, GovWare, which will get with the new surveillance law. It's, the question is about the infection. So how does this uh, state-sponsored Trojan get onto the device that should be surveilled? We see here uh, the variants, so through a, a bug in a software. So this method, of course, uh, begs a couple of questions. Or then there's the option to uh, intrude into the room where the device is located. This is uh, the variant that's discussed in the law. Or then there's the option to do it with the help of a thir third party, for example, a proxy at the provider, an update server, a personalized app, or uh, a download of, for example, tax software. So now we have the important question, do uninvolved third parties, m may they be involved to install the state Trojan on target devices? So, the question is, do, do we have a uh, right to identify or the duty to um, testify in court? Um, this is consistent with the uh, um, Federal Justice Department, but we'll have to see what the prosecution actually kind of wants in terms of measures. Okay, so let's go to part two, the mass surveillance and uh, cable uh, wiretapping. Both of these um, uh, court proceedings are kind of strategic decisions. We want to have uh, know where the line of the sand is between um, I surveillance of individuals and uh, just surveilling everyone, which impacts the privacy of every individual. Switzerland doesn't have a 
cons uh, constitutional court, so we can't really in abs in abstract way have determined if such a law is, is legal or not. So we have to uh, start the court case ourselves and uh, sue through the instances of the courts. So the, the first one of these is for the uh, Secret Service law. This law went into power in September 2017 and has a lot of gives the Secret Service in Switzerland a lot of new powers. So, for example, using state Trojans, or or this is important in our case, um, the wiretapping, which is now legal for the Secret Service. So that went into effect on the first of September. So we. Uh, sent some questions to the um, Kabelaufklärungsdienst and we asked them to not introduce wiretapping because this surveillance will affect everyone and we're just put under general suspicion and it's because it's just kind of impossible to look for something when you don't know what it is exactly. So, we demanded also to not do the wiretapping for uh, wireless services, so satellite phones and so on. We combined these two requests because the wiretapping is an evolution of the uh, wireless and satellite reconnaissance that they are doing. That used to be a military surveillance of foreign um, proceedings and satellite surveillance was introduced through a secret project Sorry, from wireless reconnaissance, they went to satellite surveillance through a secret project in 2000. It came to light um, during two reports in 2003 and 2007 um, by the congressional, the <laughs> government watchdog, um, which describes this system, including um, some... Uh, breakages of human rights. Since this is mostly about foreign communication, of course, not only, but mostly, um, and civilian targets, it was kind of difficult to get any support against that. Since more and more communication is not going through satellites anymore, but through a fiber, this surveillance is now being expanded to wires. And this wiretapping targets the border crossing wires. Because Opposed to foreign satellites, foreign cables cannot be surveilled. But almost in every case, when the border crossing cables are involved, somebody in Switzerland um, is involved. And obviously, of course, human rights do not stop at the border. The answer to our request by the Secret Service was rather surprising. It was just a single page, and the Secret Service <laughs> presents itself as a simple, uh, simple part of the government, and they have no um, choice in this matter. And of course, the the whole um, surveillance does not. Um, violate any human rights at all. Of course, our next step was to complain to the federal um, administrative uh, court and uh, the Secret Service now has time for a response until 15th of January and 
either the court is going to decide materially on our complaint or send it back to the Secret Service, which will then also have to decide on our uh, complaint, and then we are back to the beginning for now. We have a second proceeding going on, which is about a complaint about data retention. This one's a bit older. We started in 2014, and currently um, the proceeding is stuck at the um, federal court, the highest court of Switzerland, and there have been um, written statements since this spring from the um, services, from the data protection um, organization of, of Switzerland, from the providers, from ourselves and a decision is expected to be reached next year. Since we do not have a constitutional court and the Supreme Court does not have the competence to uh, decide whether something is contrary to our constitution, a decision from the European Court of Human Rights um, is likely to be necessary. These proceedings take a long time. The complaint against data retention is probably halfway done. And with the complaint against wiretapping, we are at the very beginning. And these proceedings cost a lot of money and we are um, completely funded uh, by donations and are dependent on help from others. And this brings us to the third part, the uh, network bands. So, diejenigen, die letztes Jahr schon hier waren. Okay, those of you who were here last year should already know this image. Uh, the problem is that in the moment the politicians in Switzerland assume that uh, network blocks are a reasonable technical uh, way to solve social problems but as you can see in this picture these blocks are not very effective we've had uh, three laws that we looked at so we had the gambling law which is really focused on poker and uh, casinos that sort of thing then we have the copyright law and the communication services law so in the gambling law um, the uh, gambling addiction should be uh, kept in check and the, the money for this has to come from the cantons uh, currently and not from the casinos that actually cause uh, the gambling addiction. Now, uh, for the first time, online gambling is legal, but only on, uh, uh, if it's hosted in Switzerland. Um, so the point is that the, the um, market in Switzerland is, is currently too small to even start a big poker game at all. Um, so they want to kind of force the creation of this market by uh, protecting the Swiss market by blocking uh, foreign uh, gambling service providers online. So with the gambling law, the referendum is um, running currently. Um, the law was passed by the parliament, but uh, many of the young parties uh, seized the referendum and were now collecting signatures. Um, still thousands of signatures are coming in in these days and we really need the signature of every Swiss person who is here. If you haven't yet signed the referendum, uh, please do and uh, send in the form or bring it by at, at our... Uh, stand. It's going to be a really close one. Also, what we did beforehand is uh, we tried to influence the commissions of the parliament discussing this law, but it's very hard to explain to a politician that net blocks aren't effective, even when you actually demonstrate it live to them on their computer. Now to the copyright law, it's uh, about rewriting it completely. Sorry. Yeah, one, it should be rewritten completely. 
the good thing is the legal private copy is going to stay, including the uh, free legal downloads. But what happens now is that uh, protection of images is going to be a new. Um, previously, we you had to have a certain uh, artistic contribution so that an image could be protected. But now, basically, every picture that's taken is protected by copyright law. This is going to be interesting, what uh, what happens with this. I mean, you in Germany, you've already have a bit of experience with this kind of rule. Then, regarding abandoned works, the regulations get a bit better, it's a bit more clear how to kind of put uh, books that are out of print back into print. Um, then we extended some uh, protection periods to 70 years. It's kind of a technical adjustment that's not really necessary. Then we have take and stay down rules for providers of contents by users. So this means that if a user from a provider, uh, if a user uploads a file, and uh, a film distributor says this is our content take this town then the service provider has to provide means which is economically reasonable so that this content will never be available again which that specifically means will probably have to be dealt with by the courts. Then, uh, one of the court decisions of the federal law um, will be overwritten, and before it was not available to um, request the data of a file share to then be able to prosecute them, and that has now been changed um, and is now explicitly possible. Uh, we will see how these things develop. And the premise for this revision was um, to adapt it to the Internet age. Except they just didn't do that. Um, there is no right to remix, there is no explicit fair use, so anybody who makes memes or uploads memes can technically be, um, be uh, fined up to 10,000 Swiss francs. Currently, um, the feedback, the massive feedbacks, up to 100 pages each, um, have been um, processed, but the input from civil society mostly ignored. Well, there is one ray of hope. The network bands have been thrown out, but the music industry will still demand them and they will find politicians, parliamentarians who will um, work on, on, on making them happen. Currently, this um, law will get into the um, commissions, and um, interestingly, there are two different commissions in the uh, States Council and in the National Council um, in charge of this. I don't know how often that happens, it just seems odd to me. So what do we try to do against it? Or at least what do we do so that it gets better, if not stop it entirely? Of course, we try to influence the commissions. Um, we try to explain to politicians that the, the uh, measures they try to take are not effective. And we formed a working group um, which brings people from different parties together and uh, tries to inform them so that they can send people to others from their party um, so that they can argue, hey, this, this actually goes against our own party line and try to influence them that way. We had a first meeting this month and later are going to happen. One is going to be at our own Congress 
Um, we'll see when the others, the next ones are. On the telecommunications law, we talked about it last year a little bit. Um, uh, we've, we're a little bit further ahead now. This again is about network bans, um, in this case to suppress pornographic content. So far, there was a bit of a codex that several providers adhere to. They set up DNS ban for certain um, websites, which they were informed of by the Justice Department. And now this should um, apply to all access providers. This list of banned DNS um, will be much bigger, but we'll see how much bigger it is. Um, they want to regulate um, the last mile of fiber. We wanted that to be separate of the medium, but the, the big Swisscom provider is trying to have that um, the way they like. Roaming fees are going to be regulated, probably. We had a motion in the States Council two years ago, but that didn't materialize because, of course, the market is in charge. And, of course, we know from looking at the Swiss mobile provider um, landscape, the market is not really regulating this. Um, there is no fixed next neutrality, no explicit next neutrality. There is a codex that the providers have set up, um, which has been uh, accepted as the current state of things. It's been hyped in the media, and while we argued that it doesn't do anything and, and kind of goes in the exact opposite direction of the EU and Germany, well, it, People in Switzerland just haven't, don't really see it. And uh, they don't do anything against uh, offers that include zero rating. Yeah, we're trying to get our opinion heard in the commissions, in the parliament, that uh, net neutrality should be really clearly be a legal requirement. So this is the the current state of the telecommunications law. Um, the call for public opinion is completed. There was a discussion in the commissions. Uh, we were invited to um, discuss the law in the commissions and try to invite ourselves in some of the meetings. And um, well, the commission still has to vote on the individual articles and our input. There are still going to be more hearings in the commissions on the Telecommunications Act and uh, probably in the spring session of the parliaments and, and in the summer it's going to be in, in the big chamber of the parliament. So, let's go to the e-government strategy of the federal government. There are uh, two big uh, parts here. There's e-voting and electronic identification. Um, we have to do something here. The uh, Department of Justice um, quickly uh, does things here, but they don't do it really thorough. Um, the politicians in Bern use these topics uh, to kind of position themselves as uh, ICT politicians. Well, but uh, of course, um, many of them don't really have a uh, lot of technical background on these topics. So, let's have a look at the electronic identity. So, there should be multiple identity providers who can provide uh, verified data, such as name, birth date, address, and with these addresses, for example, it can be used for uh, debt collectors or uh, uh, uniquely identify a person to, for example, when they want to open a bank account or something like that. So from the Postal Service, the Swisscom and uh, the train service, uh, they uh, pushed through their variant together with the Justice Department. This builds on the Swiss ID 
So private companies issue these electronic I forms of identity. Uh, so does anyone here have a Swiss ID? Well, okay. So you can tell uh, three people here, so uh, that's how well adopted the Swiss ID is. So the idea is that uh, banks, for example, can use this form of identification and pay per identification uh, times they need this data. So, we have a lot of problems now. Um, we think only a state-run institution can really do this form of electronic identification. The Swiss ID hasn't worked because the enrollment process was too complicated and the, the current form of electronic identity is not really planned with the customer in mind. I mean, I'm not going to open a new bank account next year just because I have an EID. Uh, and I can do this now with an EID. But then having interactions with the government as a normal person, such as uh, filing a tax uh, receipt, um, is, is already possible without an electronic ID. I mean, I can't really understand who should be using this, and it's probably going to be too expensive because the administrative overhead is huge for these probably like 10,000 of cards that are given out. So it's going to be discussed in the commissions next. There is a central um, concept from the Swiss Data Alliance and the thing I'm missing from that is um, the um, ability to do digital signatures and encryption. Uh, with that, I would see rather more of a spread for that. On e-voting, just quickly. The systems of the first generation are dead. The system that, um, that the Canton of Zurich used cannot be used any longer. Currently, the systems of the next generation are being used of the second generation and they cannot be used everywhere because the uh, laws as a base um, are missing for people to uh, for the entire population of a canton to vote using these systems then there is a rather weird motion um, where one million Swiss francs shall be um, provided for uh, hacking the e-voting system, which is of course utter bullshit because somebody who has the um, option to hack these systems will make a much larger profit than one million. And that's of course very different from something like a... Uh, well, they make a lot of, they'll make a lot of profit because they will just hope they'll just hack the vote on, on a big project like a new Gotthard. And of course, even if nobody finds it, um, even if nobody collects the bug bounty, then it's not clear that the system is actually secure. You can't prove that. Our demands are still the same. It's the same as last year. We want that e-voting is verifiable by everybody who casts a vote, that their vote counts as they cast, and that's just not possible. Even I cannot verify um, these cryptographic protocols that are being used entirely. And even if I could, I couldn't prove that the software system that I looked at is the one that is being used. And everyone who had to reset the computer of their sister or their parents knows how vulnerable these devices are. And they are supposed to be the, the, the clients for these voting systems. And, well, that's just, that's not going to work. And now Martin is going to tell you something about the data protection law. Thank you, Paki. 
Yeah, the data. All want digital. Werden. All want so everybody wants to uh, become digital, and everybody wants to harvest this data bounty. And in Germany, we have a, a Swiss uh, privacy protection law when it. Uh, was in was enacted in 1992 but of course um, the internet looked completely different the the services from the US that we now use every day didn't exist and uh, so in May 2018 uh, 2018 the new EU data protection regulations are going to uh, come into power and in Switzerland we have to decide um, uh, the EU has to decide if the Swiss law is kind of compatible with the EU uh, Privacy Protection Act. And this is, we need this so that we can still exchange data with uh, EU companies. So our first um, draft was a catastrophe, and now we have a second one, which is a bit better, that's now discussed in Parliament. So this basic idea of... Um, so you can process personal data unless it's prohibited. That's our basic idea. And in the EU, it's the other way around, actually. So, for example, there you need explicit permission to process personal data. So if you look at um, this draft in Switzerland now, uh, a lot of things that uh, are there are missing. In the EU, they have this Markdort Prinzip, which means um, all data that is processed has to be processed under EU law. In, the, in Switzerland, this is not part of the law. So, for example, if you're a Swiss person living in Switzerland, then Facebook doesn't have to apply Swiss privacy laws to your data. Then there's the uh, explicit right to uh, forgetting. I mean, we know this in practice in Switzerland, but it's not in the new draft of the law. Then there's Datenübertragbarkeit, which we don't have in the Swiss law. We first want to see how the EU handles this. And then uh, companies don't have to prove that they uh, act according to law only when there is a legal uh, action, they have to provide this. And in the EU, uh, companies can be fined up to 4% of, uh, of their revenue or 20 million euro. Um, that's kind of targeted towards US services. This is not part in the Swiss law. Um, but we have a few good things. So we have uh, self-regulation of um, certain industries. This is good, so that um, industries can decide for themselves how they are in compliance with the law. Then there are kind of... Uh, um, companies have to do risk management when data are stolen for high-risk things. And we have more uh, sanctions and fines up to 250,000 francs but not against companies, only against uh, natural persons. And then the privacy officers uh, get new, gets new competencies and can at some point even uh, initiate legal action. If, well, of course, if he has the resources to do this at all. So the big problem is we can't really um, enact this into practice. So, um, of course, self-regulation is good and certifications is good. And, and, but, I mean, how will all these companies and the economy do this? What happens when something goes wrong? What can basically affected people uh, do when something goes wrong? Or if I want to have data on me deleted, then there's no legal remedy for this. So this is important for us. We have um, these, the following things that we want. So there, it should be possible to have sanctions against companies without uh, criminal uh, legal action. Um, want to be able to... Currently, only individuals can be prosecuted and then the company just basically finds a scapegoat. 
and uh, the company gets off scot-free. So we had this case of Bank Coop recently, where they did an investigation internally, and then nobody really was at fault, and they uh, took an intern to take the fall there. And so basically, she had to give her head. So nobody was sanctioned, but uh, she was just uh, picked as the scapegoat in this case. Then, uh, of course, these 250,000 francs, francs fine are not high enough. They're uh, lower than in the EU. We want to have them on the European level. Then there are no class action lawsuits in Switzerland. So it would be nice if an organization such as us, the Digital Society, could uh, file such class action lawsuits. Then in Switzerland we also have the issue that you as the affected person have to prove that uh, your rights have been violated and it should be the other way around. And then also we don't want that you have to discuss which, uh, which country's laws apply uh, for Swiss people, Swiss privacy law should apply by default. There are hearings in the parliament, for example in the uh, state political commission and in the beginning of the year the parliament will take up this notion and uh, the data protection officers of the cantons are uh, say this is a really bad draft uh, rewrite it and um, also uh, from the economy think tanks uh, there is a lot of pushback against this law but probably uh, Switzerland will just pass this law quickly because the European Union, uh, so that the European Union doesn't give us any problem. So these were current uh, topics that we are working on and um, we are here on the Congress uh, are having more uh, program. Directly after the um, presentation, we invite you to come to over to the Rights and Freedom Assembly in, in Hall 3 and visit us, talk to us, we can discuss stuff about net, internet politics in Switzerland now and in the future. We also have our own place there and uh, we invite you to visit us there and we'll talk for example about the gambling laws or you can just or you can inscribe to the newsletter quite old fashioned pencil and paper or you can visit us on our very first um, winter congress 21st of February in Zurich there are a few places left and you are very welcome there thanks a lot and um, we are now ready for Questions. Ja, recht herzlichen Dank, merci für den Vortrag. Fragen zuerst einmal vielleicht an den Mikrofonen bitte aufreihen und die erste Frage, falls es eine gibt, aus dem Internet. Please line up at the microphones. There aren't many questions from the internet. Okay, so counting the votes can now not really uh, be done correctly, or you can check this. So why is this different for e-voting? I am I strongly disagree. Um, I have uh, done this for years, and I help out with the counting. And yes, it's not perfect, but there are a lot of people. There are many small moving parts. You can, if you want to, watch. And uh, if you suspect an error, you can restart, which happens from time to time. And the probability that a single person can manipulate a, a, an election or a vote um, is is minuscule and you'd need too many people. 
Whereas with e-voting, there would be a black box and you can do whatever you want. But in the end, almost nobody understands that it's a black op. You get a result and you can't verify it. And even then, what happens if I think, no, I, I it was counted wrong? Um, trust in the system is, is gone really soon, which you can provide very well with the current system. And, of course, there are improvements to be done, especially with voting by mail. Thanks for the talk. I have a question about net neutrality. So, the Americans are suffering here because they don't have a market uh, as far as internet service providers are concerned. So, there you only have one provider usually. Uh, the fiber networks are owned privately. In Europe, this isn't usually the case. So, I understand your argumentation a bit that you want a, a legal basis for net neutrality, but it's not very urgent, right? So, I mean, how should net neutrality look in the law, according to you? So the violations on the last mile, the, 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 the zero rating already exists quite quite in a big way in, in cellular services from most providers. And even today, I can't really choose a provider who does not at all try to do, to, to do zero rating at all. And especially with zero rating, the problem is that it's from the end point, from the point of view of the consumer, it's actually a, it's a benefit because I have this data which is not being counted against my cap. And sort of through that, sneakily, you introduce a violation of net neutrality. And in the first moment, it doesn't really hurt me. And that's why there needs to be regulation um, to prevent this sneaky add-in of these limitations. And for example, zero rating for Netflix makes it almost impossible for a second provider to get into this market. Because it, especially in Switzerland, it's already a small market. Is there another question from the internet? No, no further questions from the internet. Dann recht herzlichen Dank an Kire, Paki und Martin aus der Schweiz. So thanks to Kire, Paki and Martin from Switzerland.